Welcome to Game Hacking 209. In this video, we're going to get into how to write more complex scripts that will let us manipulate game mechanics even more than we've been doing throughout the series. Now, as always, keep in mind that this video builds from all the previous videos in the series. So, if you watch this video and you get completely lost, go back and check out any videos you might have missed. But alright, before we jump back into a previous script and start adding a bunch of stuff to it, let's load up a blank auto-assembler window and take a deeper look at how code injection scripts actually work so we know exactly where to put those things we're going to add. So I'd say like 90% of the time, you're going to want a script that you can add to your cheat table so you can activate it anytime you load up your game. And the only two things you need to do that is an enable and a disable. And now we can add the script to the cheat table. But of course, our script doesn't actually do anything yet because there's nothing else in it. So let's head back in and give it a purpose. And a few of the main things we can do with the script is change, remove, or add new code into the game. Let's start by changing existing game code. And the only thing we need for this is the address of the code we want to change. So in the memory view, I've got the instruction highlighted that subtracts damage from health that we found in Game Hacking 205. Now, let's say we want to change this instruction to add damage instead of subtract it. All we need is to key in the address exactly as we see it, then we just add a colon, and now we can just retype the instruction with add instead of sub. And we can see that sub has been replaced with add. But when I deactivate the script, nothing happens. And that's because I didn't tell the script to actually do anything when I disable it. So under disable, I'll use the same address, but replace the add back with sub. And now when I deactivate and reactivate the script, the add and sub get changed back and forth. And in the game, we can see that we're now gaining health as we take hits. Now, let's change the script to just remove this instruction completely so we don't gain or lose health. But I can't just remove the instruction. Because as we see, now the script doesn't seem to be doing anything. And that's because we're literally telling Cheat Engine to go to this address and do nothing. So, to actually disable an instruction, we can use a command called NOP, which stands for no operation. Now, this command doesn't take any operands at all and only affects one byte of NOP code. And to understand what I mean, we need to take a look at the bytes column in the disassembler. These bytes are what the CPU actually reads. They're the real op codes for assembly. For example, this 29F8 is what the CPU recognizes the sub EAX EDI and the text that we see is only here to make reading the code easier for us. And when we type in an assembly instruction like the sub EAX EDI, Cheat Engine knows to convert that to the bytes associated with that instruction so the CPU knows how to read it. And like we just discussed, with the NOP here, we see that the first byte becomes 9-0. And when the CPU sees 9-0, it performs an operation that changes absolutely nothing. So we can think of 9-0 or NOP as kind of a placeholder. Now, the reason the first byte becomes 9-0 is because Neo.exe plus 7AF783 refers specifically to the first byte in the sub-instruction, while .exe plus 7AF784 refers to F8, which is the second byte of the sub-instruction, which is also why the beginning of the next instruction is .exe plus 7AF785, and if I activate this script again, we can see that F8's address is indeed .exe 7af784. And the reason we can see that is because NOP only takes up one byte. So the next byte is assumed by the CPU to be the beginning of a new instruction. But now we see that F8 is being interpreted by the CPU as a completely different instruction. And this is what happens when you NOP or remove only some of the bytes of an opcode. The leftover bytes become interpreted as completely different instructions, which we generally don't want to happen because we might break game mechanics or even crash the game. So to fix that, I'll add a second knob, which will overwrite the next byte after 2.9, which is the F8. And now since we don't have any leftover bytes, we've safely removed the health minus damage opcode without changing any of the other instructions in the game. <laughs> And another way we can do this is use db, and by changing the two bytes of the address of the health minus damage opcode to 90, it has the same effect as typing in two knobs. But this script currently affects both the player and the enemies right now because these instructions affect everyone taking damage. 
And if we want to separate the player and the enemies like we've been doing in the series, we can't really do that by directly modifying the game code like this in its original location. Because as we've seen, this overwrites the game instructions which most likely need to run so we don't cause issues with the game. But what we can do is insert or inject new code into an area of memory that isn't being used by the game. And Cheat Engine makes this extremely easy for us with its alloc function which finds an area of memory with nothing in it and allocates it for us to use as we see fit. And we've already used the alloc function in the series quite a few times, but as a quick review, for the function to work, we just need a name and a number of bytes to allocate. And I'm just typing in the defaults for a code injection template right now. And the third parameter, which is optional, but almost always recommended for a 64-bit game, tells Cheat Engine to try to find a block of empty memory as close as possible to the entered address. Now, this new allocated memory is out there somewhere waiting for us to use it. To find an address, we can normally hit Control G, but I can't search for new mem, the name of the allocated memory right now. And that's because I need to go back to the script and register our name as a symbol, so it will be recognized and usable outside of the script window. And it's always a good idea to deallocate our memory and unregister our symbols under disable. And now I can hit Control G again and type in our allocated address symbol name, which takes us to our allocated memory, which we can see is not a part of the game.exe's allocated memory. And we have exactly 2048 bytes of ready to use allocated memory represented by these double zeros. But whatever code we put in new mem won't even matter if it doesn't get executed. So back at .exe plus 7af783, I'll place a jump to new mem. And now when the CPU runs this game code, it will hit our jump to new mem and start running our code at the very first byte of the allocated memory. But we've made a bit of a mess back in the game's main memory, because our jump instruction, just like every other instruction, takes up a certain number of bytes. Specifically in our case, it takes 5 bytes. And since the sub instruction is only 2 bytes long, our jump writes over additional bytes and replaces more instructions. But the script doesn't restore the additional replaced instructions when I disable it. So back in the script, let's add the two instructions that are also being replaced under disable so they get restored now. And notice that because the jump takes up 5 bytes, it will replace the sub EAX EDI, the test EDI EDI, in the first byte of the JLE instruction. Which is causing a whole different issue because we have this leftover byte that's being reinterpreted as the start of a new instruction and is causing a chain reaction that's changing multiple lines of code beneath it. So to fix this, we can simply come under the jump new mem and add a nop to change that leftover byte to 9-0, which won't screw with any of the game code. Alright, so now that we have a jump to our allocated memory that doesn't screw up other instructions, we can finally start adding new code into our allocated memory. And the first thing we should probably do is add the instructions we replace with our jump to new mem inside the allocated memory. And to do that, I'll copy the instructions I added down here earlier, and I'll type the name I use in the alloc function followed by a colon. And because we allocated memory using this name, when I declare a name like this, it will cause the scope of the script to change. And all that means is that whatever instructions we enter here will happen starting at neo.exe plus 7af783, and any instructions under new mem will be injected into the memory starting at new mem. Now, you might notice that there's a jump if not greater than command up here instead of the jump if less than or equal to command over here. But jump if not greater has the same logic as jump if less than or equal, so both of these will have the exact same effect. So just keep in mind that Cheat Engine may inject instructions that are synonymous, but different. But okay, we're still missing one thing before we can activate our script without crashing the game when we run it. We need a way back to the .exe memory to continue running the rest of the normal game instructions. So at the bottom of our code, I'll add a jump to the address immediately following the code we replaced back in the games.exe memory. And now we have a foundation where we can add new code and mod the game's mechanics as we see fit. And as an example, we can separate the player and enemies by comparing a certain value at a certain address, but we need somewhere for the enemies to jump to. This is where a label comes in, and the only needed parameter for a label function is a name and by entering the name with a colon after it, we associate the code below it with that name. And we can now use the name as the destination for jumps. Now, one major difference for label declarations as opposed to alloc declarations is that there is no change in scope when you declare a label. So the code under original instructions is still inside the memory of new mem. So all a label does is assign our chosen name to a byte inside the allocated memory that's declared above it. 
So even though we can't see the name in the memory viewer, Cheat Engine assigns the name original instructions to the address ending with 000D. Now, notice what happens if I add another instruction above the label declaration. The JNE destination is now the address ending in 012, which is where the sub instruction now begins. So Cheat Engine will automatically change the jump address destinations to always point to the address byte named by the label even as we add or remove code from a script. And since the player value is 2 at this address and we have a jump back to the game.exe address right here, the player should skip the damage instruction while the enemies still take damage. Now, one last note about the label function is that it names the byte immediately following the last byte of the instruction above it, even if you don't place any code under its declaration. And to show that, I'll add another label which can be done like this, or if you have cheated in version 7.2 or higher, you can add a space and type another label name like this. Either way, same thing. And if I declare the label name directly under the knob, this label name can now be used in the place of .exe plus 7af789 in our script. And when we activate it, we can see that Cheat Engine still puts 7AF789 as the destination of the jumps. And of course, we can follow the jump and see that it does indeed take us to the address of the first byte immediately following our knob back in the game.exe memory. And if I create another script using the code injection template, we can see that it almost instantly creates pretty much the same foundation of code that I just typed in manually. And the only key differences really are that the template doesn't have new mem registered as a symbol, which we don't actually need in our script either. And it has the game.exe declaration and instructions down here just above disable, which we can do in our script as well. And everything under the declaration for new mem will still be injected into the allocated memory for new mem, while the code under .exe plus 7af783 will be injected into the allocated memory starting at that address. But all right, let's head back to the script we've been working on for a few videos now. And before we add anything, let's streamline this a bit. First, I can add all the label names into one function, and we can do the same with our registered symbol names as well. And I'm going to tighten up all this white space just in case you want to read the comments to see what's going on in the script. And you can pause the video right now and do that if you like. But alright, we can tighten up the code under exit as well by putting a star inside the dealloc function and inside the unregistered symbol function which will tell Cheat Engine to deallocate all allocated memory and unregister all symbols. And I would just need the one of each. And the last bit of redundant code that I have are these three instructions which I have in two different places. So I'll move the IML instruction just above the original code label, assign a label to it, copy and paste the label name into the label function above, and change the destination of this JNE to the new label I just made. Now this hasn't really changed anything yet because the enemies still jump to the IML instruction then flow down and execute the original game code. But since I have a label for these exact three instructions below, I can delete these duplicates and change the destination of this jump from exit to original code which will still flow down to exit after they run. I'll also add a label to our compare instruction here so it's very obvious what these two lines do. And alright, let's add an option for infinite health. So I'll make another label and what I want to do is make a condition that I can use to choose whether I jump to where the player takes damage or gets infinite health. So let me drag over the script real quick and bring over the comments window where I save the current health and max health address references. And ultimately, I'd like to copy the value of max health into the current health address. But assembly doesn't support direct memory to memory moves like this, so we'll need the help of a register. And since EAX is holding the value of current health in the sub instruction, I can use it to write max health to current health. And then we jump to exit, because if we want the player to have infinite health, it would be a good idea to skip the health sub instruction, the test to see if health is zero, and the jump if less or equal to the kill instructions. So with that done, all we need now is to create a suitable condition, and I'll compare the value of our defense multiplier with a value. And I can choose whatever number I want here, so if I type in 10,000, I'll get infinite health if I set that as the symbol value in the cheat table. But I'll use zero here because if I were ever to set the symbol to zero normally, the game would crash because dividing by zero results in an undefined error. But now I can set the defense multiplier to zero and get infinite health instead of a crash. And all right, for the next extension of the script, let's create another section for one hit kills. And we know we'll need a condition in a jump. 
And then if we want one hit kills, we'll simply place zero into EAX and jump to the original code where it's guaranteed that enemy health will be zero or less, so they'll always die when they take damage. And now that I think about it, we don't actually need this jump because we can let the IMO damage instruction run without any issues. But okay, for the condition, I use the damage multiplier symbol and compare it to zero so that now instead of zero causing no damage to enemies, we'll get a one hit kill. Let's check to make sure that our defense multiplier and damage multiplier still works as well. And they do. But this script still has an issue. If I set the defense too high, I no longer take any damage at all. And that's because, as explored in Game Hacking 208, there are no fractions in energy division. So if an enemy does, for example, 200 damage and I set the division to 300, well, 300 goes into 200 zero times, so the quotient will be zero with the remainder of 200. And it's the quotient inside EAX that we copy into EDI. So we're basically making damage zero anytime the division amount exceeds the amount of damage an enemy deals to the player, which you might be okay with, but I want the player to take at least one damage unless infinite health is turned on. So to do that, I'll come under the division and compare EDI to zero. And if it is zero, I'll increment it by one. And now no matter how much I increase defense, I'll always take at least one damage. Unless, of course, I set it to zero. So, with our defense multiplier and damage multiplier set to zero, we have a simple god mode. And since we've covered some of the fundamentals of how these scripts work, we can get a bit fancy here and write a script that sets our symbols to zero when we enable, and one when we disable. Just keep in mind that we can only refer to these names in a different script because they're registered as symbols. And now we can activate this script to swap between normal damage and defense and god mode. But our god mode script relies on the symbol names being registered in this script. So we'll want to finish this off by making our god mode script a child of this script. Now, just like with most things, this works a bit differently with XMM registers. Like the script we made in Jedi Fallen Order back in Game Hacking 207. But before we can even get into that, I have a big problem. The game has received an update and our script kind of crashes the game. So be sure to check out Game Hacking 210 where we explore how to fix broken scripts and write scripts that are a lot more resilient to game patches and updates. And as always, thanks for watching. See you next time.